Yeah. New wave, if you can hear me. Morning, everybody. Evening, people who are listening. Unmute yourself, say hi. Hi. Hi, hi everybody. Hi. 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 Lots and lots of familiar faces. That's lovely. Oh, so your hair looks different. Yeah, that's the curly part. Of I'm it. loving, I'm a curly haired person as well, but you wouldn't know it, would you? And see me in humid <laughs> conditions one day. Morning, morning. Hiya, give me a smile and a wave. I'm on the second page here. I can see Nicole there. Hi, everybody. Hi. You can show me your face. Do. Some people I know might be having problems with your... there. Sam Shanks, I'm loving your picture with your lollipop eyes there. Not me. <laughs> oh, wonderful to see you all. Thank you so much for joining me. Don't forget to smile lots because those of you that are smiling, really, some people are looking very serious. Some people are going, what day is it? Yeah, still. So I'm just going to let more people in. We're up to 70 people, everybody, already. Wow, that's yeah. a lot. Fantastic. I wanted to let you in early because we've had so many people join. I've had 200 and odd people joined since yesterday and we're up to nearly 4,000 on the group now since the beginning of lockdown. How's that? Whoa. Early Whoa. years, that's the place to be. Early years maths particularly. So welcome everybody. Okay, to make sure that everything's working okay and just have a bit of fun as well. Today, I would like you to um, say where in the world you're calling in from and what was the last thing you had to eat? Because we're all at different times of the day, so it might be very different. We'll have a little look at what people say. Mine was boiled eggs. I've just had my breakfast. It was very nice. Oh, snap, Karen. I had boiled eggs this morning. <laughs> so type it in your boxes. Everybody find the chat. Hi, Karen, and I'll watch the um, them coming through. Okay, so we've got, well done, English people, you were very hot off there, they're coming through, I think it's a bit more of a time delay around the world. Oh, just Croissant, very hot. Don't forget to say where you're from as well. Some people are putting one or the other, I want to know where you're ringing in from and what you had for breakfast. Multitasking people. Oh, sandwich, Diana, nice. Oh, Nicole, yeah, you have to put this every time, great views and strawberries. Hi from Poland, Amelia. What did you have for your last meal? I imagine that sounds like that sounds ominous, doesn't it? I mean, what was the last thing you ate? Nick's having, I oh, was it? No, Linda's having strawberries. Everything's going so fast here. Scorching Q8. What temperature is it in Q8 today, people? 46. 46. Oh, <laughs> we, we got up to like a heady 24 in the UK and we were dying. Yeah, so it was very humid, I have to say, but 46. Ooh, wheat a bix, nice. Rice Krispies, I haven't had Rice Krispies in years. So Jill Gallup, you say just joining a webinar um, with Deb. Coming in from. <laughs> Jill, unmute yourself and tell me you've said 30. Is Where okay? are you? Yeah. Hello. If Jill, if Jill Gallup can hear me, tell me where in the world you are. <laughs> Nope, she's run off 30 degrees. Right, just letting a few more people in. Blistering Q8. Oh, what's, so what is it? Midday in Q8. Yeah. Having a look here. I'm hoping as well that we've got some people from the other end of the planet because one of the reasons I'm running them at this time of the day is to let those of you from uh, New Zealand, Australia, and anywhere. Uh, in the Far East, so do let us know as well if you're, oh, it's quite a few Lincolnshire people, Jen. Oh, I see. Yeah. I, it now. I don't believe <laughs> Jem and Jill that it's this warm in Lincolnshire all the time. I lived there for four years. I must have, it must have been a different time of place. I don't remember it being really hot like that. But no, it's a believe it. Okay, right. I'm going to just keep an eye on the door, everybody. We're up to eight people now, which is absolutely wonderful. So my next question to the district Can everybody see my board okay? Just give me some nods and thumbs up. Okay, I want you to tell me whether you are new to 
the page and the group and therefore you are preparing to go with your learning and all the potential that we can offer you are you someone who's doing the six day training which is it's actually six days of free ideas and i'll show you that later if you don't know what that is and so let somebody in um, so that up. are you a graduate of the teaching essential number sense foundation course foundation masterclass or are you a graduate plus where you have done you might have done this but you've definitely done the teaching essential number sense you've done the mastery stories and you might have even done more than that so let's have a look have a look what everybody else is writing on the screen Absolutely. wonderful wonderful and make sure if you're new the thing you need to really tune into is the six days of free training that will get you going Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Come here. Can everybody see the, the comments coming up? Just make sure you've got the chat switched on so you can see what everyone's saying. Yeah. If I say 80, those people have done the training, I hope you're picturing this on 10 frames. Yeah, you no longer see 80 in the way that you used to. Could everyone mute themselves? I can't hear Karen, says Ruth Burton. So I think, Ruth, I might be able to mute everybody. Let's have a look with my power here. Let's see, excuse me a minute. Mute myself, hang on. Uh, okay, Ruth, is that okay for you now? Because I'm just looking, there is a way I can mute everybody, but I can't see it on the screen and probably staring me right in the face. But um, everyone okay for noise? I'm just gonna check across, I've got four screens to look at. So give me a thumbs up if you can hear me clearly and you haven't got any sort of interference on the line, I'll just check across the pages to see who's listening. Thank you, Nina, nice to see you. Ooh, I've got page three. I've got nobody using a video. And page four as well. So we've got page three and page four being very shy. And page one and page two, that must be how it sorts you out. If you're showing me on video, it's pushed you to page one. So that's really nice. Okay, everybody, let's get going. Um, I'm just gonna, if I look a little bit distracted, it's just because there's Oh, I see, I've just found my mute all now that I'm not looking for it, of course. Eye on that. Okay, did everybody, if, don't worry if you didn't see this, but did most people see the message that I put up the update? You obviously saw the, the code and it was part of that about bringing some bits and pieces with you today. Yeah, that's also to get you more excited about the, the meeting. Like, oh, who, who brought an apple last time? Lots of people, yeah, like we, we did the apple task. If you haven't seen the last webinar, because you're new to the group and there's one before that as well they are on the facebook page so the first thing i'm going to share with you i think it might be someone needs to mute i'm just going to try and mute everybody okay is that better yeah, thanks. Rani was waving at me there. Thank you. I, you don't know who I can see, obviously, so wave madly and write me a little message if anything's going wrong. I'll just move the messages down. Okay, let's have a look at where I need to be. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, and I'm just, this should show you the EEF document, which um, it would be really helpful if you had access to. Don't worry if you don't. We'll just. Okay, can you see, oh, you saw my Facebook page and now it's gone again. Shrink that down. This is where you get to see my life in a way that probably would don't want to show you. Hang on a minute. Everybody see my Facebook page? I, do you know, I've got nobody, I can see, I can only see people's names, so that's, that's not very helpful. I might have to move the screen oh, a little bit. It's Thank Jem. you, I can, someone spoke to me. Oh, I've got Jem, great Jem. I can only see the Improving Mathematics document, not your Facebook page. Okay, thanks for that, Jem. I'll do a stop share and then, brilliant. Jem's my right-hand woman, keeping me sorted. Okay, so I'm just going to put that up. If I do a new share. Right, Jem, can you see my Facebook page now? Yeah. 
great thank you so do keep me I don't know why the steve my neighbor is popping up go away steve oh well okay so here this is some of you will have come in on the um the early years facebook page but one of the top tips i'd give you straight away is make sure you join this group as well this is the group where most of the things happen so just take a look at that there teaching early years maths three to five and this is the one where so many people have joined this week here we're up to 3,800 members and those 231 are in the last 24 hours because I wrote a, a post to the others recently. So I just want to show you a few things on here if you are new to the group. So if I go down here and pass the webinar, I post a lot of challenges related to using subitizing. Subitizing is the basis of all the mathematical training that I do. And some of you know a lot about that, and some of you know a little, and some of you won't know anything at all. And if you think you know about subitizing to do with dice patterns, there's so much more to learn. So I would suggest that what you do is you have a look at the activity here, for example. If I open that up, I've given you lots of advice on division. So really lovely pictures there. If you go down here, you can see it says day one of the super subitizing challenge, and that's been categorized here in a unit. So if I click on the unit here, it's a bit slow, I'm afraid it's Welsh internet and it's very slow. We'll get there eventually. Can you see that this brings you up lots and lots of posts about subitizing? And these are lovely things that people in the group posted in response to a task that I put on a couple of weeks ago. Here's some sheep and dog subitizing, a beautiful book that we've all made this person very rich by buying. And if you go to the unit section itself, I'll just finish here. There are lots and lots of sections that you can look through with information. And it means that a page that is very, very full becomes much easier to find things. So can you see here, it says Zoom webinar re recorded links, and you've got the 4th of June, webinar you've got the 14th of june and you'll have today's there as well so if you're unfamiliar with this this is a way that you that facebook can set up its pages you've got your discussion there and just look out for that units option and you can go and find what you need so hopefully that's helpful i shall and if anybody particularly people who know me very well if there's anything that you think i be worth me mentioning and I don't mention it, either unmute yourself and come on and just say something because I may miss your comment in the box. Okay, right, I'm just gonna, I've got more people coming in. 85 people, amazing, that is wonderful. Okay, so today, if you can sort of multitask in front of you, I will show you the document on the screen. We're gonna continue to look at that document that I uh, shared, which is the EEF document. It looks like this. Mine is becoming increasingly well loved, as in a bit tatty now. The cat walked over it the other day, so it's looking really well loved. But that document there, I would strongly recommend that you get a hard copy of this document because it is really, really worth taking on board the messages in it. And what we're doing in this training is I'm helping you to unpack the statements so that you have the time and space to, to notice what's in here. Because I think if you're anything like me, you mean to read these things, you've really dedicated to your job, but finding the space in your lives to do it just doesn't happen. Other things are always getting in the way. So this is precious time for you to look at this. But those of you who've done the other webinars with me, or if you go back and watch the videos, you'll know there's a lot that I think is missing in this document. And that's really good because what we're doing is being critical professionals. And the more we question things and the more knowledge we bring to our practice, the better we will be. Um, I, I'm just going to look for some nods or shakes of heads around the room here when I ask this, but are you aware that we are, we're kind of working to too much of a recipe in education, not just early years, because we don't have as much knowledge as we need and because we don't know what we don't know, too many people in maths are following a scheme of work, for example. You're not really confident with your own subject knowledge yet so that you can use a scheme of work to support your work but you don't want that to lead the way and those of you who've done lots of training with me have become almost painfully aware of that and then you've moved beyond that into a brilliant place so using a document like this can really help you to become aware of what you didn't know you didn't know and you'll see i started to tag a lot of posts with that so that's what we're going to have a look at today 
couple more people coming in. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. So just let me know if you don't see what um, I want you to see. So it should go to my Facebook first, and then I'm gonna put the document back on. Okay, so you should be able to see the improving maths news. Now, Gem, I can see you on my screen. Can you see that? Brilliant, thanks. So what we're gonna do is I thought we would um, start with a bit of a recap on some of the key messages that I've given in the other webinars. So whether you were on the webinars with me or not, these are really important things. And even if you've heard me say them before, you'll know that when someone reminds you of things, you think, oh gosh, yeah, of course, that was really important. So I'm gonna skip over to my PowerPoint to keep me right here and we'll start to have a look through some of those. So here's some, Gem, is that showing you the webinar aims? Yeah, great. So these, this is what we're going to have a look at today. The time will go incredibly quickly so I would really recommend that if you have questions, clearly put them in the box. I can see the, the chat box now here. But if you have questions, maybe jot them down and put them on the, the, the Facebook page afterwards, because the problem with the recording is it doesn't record your comments. And I didn't realize that to begin with. So your comments and questions are so valuable for everybody, particularly those people who can't make it today. So do capture them and do fit. You know, I'll put a, a post on after the webinar and put your questions underneath there. That'd be really helpful. Some people are asking about the, uh, the document. Yeah, literally just type into Google EEF, which is Education Endowment Foundation. And, and if you put early years maths, it will come up. It's a very good document, it's free. Okay, so I've said this already, the webinars are about giving you precious headspace because the fact you're on here and the fact that you've joined the Facebook page means you are somebody who wants to learn, who wants to change, and giving you that space to think is so important. We're looking at this section about manipulatives. It's manipulatives and representations, and the idea of a representation is to do with drawing. And the more I've looked at this, the more I've realized that we're going to have to do lots and lots of sessions on this. So there'll be lots of information available for you. So today we're going to look just at manipulatives again. So that's anything you can pick up and anything you can touch. The third point we're going to have a look at is there was a suggestion in this document that I referred to that hands-on experiences, concrete maths was kind of preferable or a nice idea almost and you think it isn't it's essential and we started to look at that last time so i think we need to be really clear that children learn as we know through hands-on experiences and in maths that needs some work we're going to look at the types of um, things available to us and also opportunities for you there so what i'm going to suggest um i'm just going to move over oh, something else there i'm going to stop that share for the moment um are you still looking at the powerpoint or is it showing you gem that i've moved screens now it's frozen halfway <laughs> it ha okay right that's thank you for thank you so let's try new share here instead okay so oh let's have a look here now you should be able to see the powerpoint and it says document at the top they got that brilliant okay so if you um have that there's the, the link there don't try and copy that down obviously you can just put that into google but the key documents i'd suggest that you um, have reference to in your practice all of the time there's a number of documents that are mentioned during training but this is one of them and the other one is of course i'll just move that down a bit so you can see is the characteristics of effective learning we have had a huge focus in all the training sessions that i'm offering on making sure this is central to our practice and it, when you ever you go into outstanding early years practice they will talk about they don't plan from development matters they plan towards those statements but they plan from the characteristics of effective learning and that shift is easy to make but not everybody's made it yet and if you've got things like white rose and power maths and so forth in the in the picture you may have moved this even further away from your focus so have that as one of your main actions from today is to really think that you plan 
through and from the characteristics of effective learning because they are wonderful and they really, really matter. So we're going to have a, have a look at that uh, and refer back to that, obviously, throughout. But I wanted to mention this first. So, Jem, can you, is that change the mental health thing? Yeah. Um, I'm working with a number of you very, very closely, and uh, Jem that's helping me here is one of them. And quite a few of the group had some big wobbles this week. And I was interested that their wobbles all happened not only in the same week, but almost on the same day. So I was thinking about this and thinking about everything you're all going through. And not all the people who had the wobbles are, have gone back to school at the same time. They're not all facing the same thing, but clearly with everything we've been through and teachers, obviously mental health is something we're talking about more, but still not enough. Um, I wanted to flag up the importance in my mind always about your mental health and well-being. And I hope that rather than you seeing coming on this morning as being oh, something else I've got to think about, I hope that particularly those of you that know me, you've come on because it's a treat to yourself. You've come on because it's something for you. It's good for you. And that's a big aim. So I was going to put, as I thought I'd show you this, I put this on some of the pages. But one of the reasons I'm sharing this with you is also because of some of the things that have been in the news this week with the choices that many, many people in the UK particularly have made, the really, really poor choices that have caused a lot of people to be very distressed. So I thought this was a really nice uh, diagram to look at. So just, I'll pause for a minute, have a look at the things that are in your control that you can change and you can take responsibility for. And there are things that are out of your control that you can't. So I'm just gonna try and make sure you can see that I'll just shrink it down a tiny bit so it fits on. Just have a look there and think about reminding yourself, particularly the things you can't control. Now, you know, write anything um, in the box that you want to, if you want to share anything, but we know all this is true, but I thought particularly with all the things about the way people behaved on the South Coast that upset a lot of people, and maybe you're finding work different and hard at the moment, you've got to have your mindset as the first port of call. And I'm going to do some webinars, I think, on mindset, because mindset has the biggest impact on how you learn, how you teach, how others learn, how you manage, how you run your, your personal life and everything. So uh, yes, Jill said things from the past. How many people spend time, emotional energy, thinking about what's happened that they can't change? And in our groups, one of the first things people did when I've talked about you should be teaching subitizing before counting. Now I'm hoping there's lots of new people going, what? and that counting doesn't lead to calculating. And the more training we've done, people have said, oh my goodness, I feel so bad because I've been teaching like this. And I'm like, don't feel bad because you didn't know what you didn't know. And that fits into that things from the past. You can't change old you teacher, but the brilliant news is you can change you from now on with the new tools you've got. So practice that mindset and we get a lot better at it. Is that, just put some comments in, is that relevant to you now? If I have I hit a nerve at all there in in your in your you know what you're feeling as I say about things in the news or or things in your job, and is it something that you know you appreciate some focus of attention or are you thinking when she's just going to get on with the maths? So you know, be honest. But let's just um, have Karen, a look and I'll see. Karen, so, sorry, Karen, sorry to interrupt you. Of Can course, you Sarah, go on. In um, our one of our teachers has been waiting to come on. Um, I think course, she's I'm under asthma B. Yeah, it, it's she's not in hidden. the waiting room, she can't. Thank you. It was behind the comments box. I've let her somebody else know as well. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks so much. Keep, do keep me informed if anything else. I'll try and put the two boxes next to each other there. Cheers. Okay, so a lot of people saying, yeah, about family members. I don't know if you can all see on the screen there. And yeah, you know, I think there is no point in us talking about our teaching and our children's learning if our needs as people are not being met. We know that. 
So I wanted to mention that there's a lot of things around. If you don't know this person's name, I'll just uh, write it down so you can see it. Go and check out this guy. So I don't know if you can see that. So Simon, oh, I'm sharing the screen on at the moment. So Simon Sinek. I think you can see me a little, a little version. So it's S-I-N-E-K, but go and have a look at his stuff. It's incredibly helpful, particularly if you're leading a team. Okay, so moving on, the other thing that I wanted to uh, share with you, someone just give me a thumbs up that everything's still working okay. Either I say pop on or just write something in the comment box to say just so I can, because everybody has disappeared from my view there. Oh, I can see, just give me some nods because I can see a few of you. I can see Rani. There we go. Yeah, great. Okay, so this was shared in the first webinar that I did, and this is Mel, who's on the call today. She, um, I invented this, this diagram, and then this is Mel's version of it, which is a fantastic version. So if you haven't seen this before, and there is something on the Facebook page. Oh, somebody just needs to mute themselves. Thank you, we got a bit noise there. <laughs> no, you love Zoom calls, I got a minute. There we go, I've muted them. So this, if you haven't seen this before, and I, I think I've got Taryn on, and I know her school showed me this in the background of their uh, senior leadership room the other day. The idea here, is this as you can see return to school but this could be used at any time of the year everything in this pyramid or this triangle here matters absolutely matters but some things matter much more and some things matter you know not as much as this but they're important and these things matter but they don't matter nearly as much as this and this and the idea here was everything that your children need and you need needs to go in here you can't operate without it so this opportunity that we've got with our maths and with our broader provision to think that when our children are, are returning as your children are or have done and when the new children start there's a lot of conversations on facebook i've seen about what people are being asked to do and you think we have to defend very strongly what we know our children absolutely need and then we can get to the things that belong up here for example like the phonics and you know learning to read and being taught maths directly they're important but unless you get these things right they don't work so there's a blank version of it which as i say i'll make sure the resources are there you can probably see down here as well this has come from the teaching maths through stories course which is one of the graduate plus courses when you've done the foundation uh, just to show you how this works very briefly starting with the end in mind what do you want for your children so mel's filled in here being safe happy included uh, being active and being communicators. So when you are planning for maths, this is absolutely the same. You want your children to feel so safe that you can take massive risks. You want them to feel so safe that they will always tell you what they're thinking and they won't think it's got to be clever, it's got to be right, it's got to be finished. None of these things matter. You just want to hear what's in their mind. And children who are in the early years tend to feel like this naturally, but depending on what happens in their lives, of course, it changes. And certainly the way we treat them, it changes. So again, if that's something there, that is on the Facebook page. I will double check after this meeting that is there, but you can download that as a file and you can have a look. But it's a very simple and very useful tool. Okay, so I'd like you to turn to page, oh, Ruth's done it with her team. Brilliant, thank you, Ruth, for that feedback. Take, turn to page 21. And I'm going to change what, what I share so you can see it on the screen as well. So if you haven't got it, no worries. Okay, I'll just see what's the quickest way of doing this. Okay, so we are on this section here, which is using manipulatives and representations to develop understanding. And this is where we started in the last webinar. So if I move to page 21 here, I think this section here is really useful. And we began to look at it last time. So you've got five bullet points there, you can see. And one of the top tips, if you're new to working with me, I would really recommend that you get your team, even if you are a, you know, you think, oh, I'm just a TA, you are part of a team, but particularly if you're a leader, get your team reading together regularly. 
preferably have hot drinks and some carbohydrates. This does tend to help. People sitting around with biscuits, cakes and coffee tend to want to sit together, obviously. You might need to think about changing where you meet if that would help and so forth. Those things are really important. But this is a great place to say, do you know, with my team, all I'm going to do is read page 21, for example, of this document with a cup of coffee and have a discussion because you want to change the mindset of your staff into being constantly reflecting on practice, constantly searching for new knowledge. So use that when you're thinking about this. So these are very, very big ideas that I cannot go into the depth we need to in this webinar, but the training certainly that I run will really help you pad this out. But let's have a look at this first one here. Ensure that children understand the links between the manipulatives and the mathematical ideas they represent. Now, my question there would be, do you know how to do that? Not how to get your children to understand that. Because most practitioners I work with, and it's really good when you can do this, say, do you know, I'm not completely sure what that means. And I don't know how to do that with my children. So we must have training and we must have time to be able to ask questions and work our way through it to the point where we think I completely understand this and I'm under, you know, developing my understanding. So then I can consider what does this mean for a three to five year old? Because what it means for a three to five year old is gonna be a much sort of different version of what you understand, but obviously your understanding needs to come first. So I'm gonna have a look at this in this session but what this is, is about is about what's called generalization in mathematics. So, and representation. So if you've got, you're making any notes here, mathematical thinking represents real life in most cases. And we create images and we create symbols that represent usually real events and real things, not always things we can touch. Things like time, obviously you can't touch, but they're real. And our children need to learn that four, for example, can represent infinite contexts in real life. So they have to have a masses of experience of seeing four in real life that could be four things or the age four or four in order and lots and lots of different things. Four is a nominal label, so it doesn't have a numerical meaning. It's, there's a lot for us to learn. And they need to realize that one number can represent any number of any any number of concepts in real life and that's called a generalization so we're going to have a look at that and most practitioners haven't been given the opportunity to think about that enough yet so don't worry if a lot of that's like Ooh, i don't know what she's talking about because that's what learning feels like we've got to be careful here then about the rationale why are you choosing the manipulative you are choosing for that mathematics and too often we hear things like choose the, the manipulative or choose the equipment you like, choose the equipment you're most comfortable with. That happens a lot in key stage one particularly. And I said in the last session, if you were trying to mend a wobbly leg on a table and you looked in your toolbox, you would not be thinking, which tool do I like? You would be thinking, which tool do I need for the job? And there would be a number of tools. If it needed, for example, a screw tightening, there would be a number of screwdrivers and you'd have to think which screwdriver would be best or do I need to try this one out and see if it fits? And there might be more than one that were just as good. Does that make sense as an analogy? Can you hear that asking children which one they like is going to get them to pick up things like the purple Numicon because they like purple? It's gonna get them to pick up the bead string because they're most familiar with it. And adults have got to be really careful that we don't encourage children to select things because they like them. Also be careful that if you teach using one bit of equipment, such as a bead string or a 10 frame, and you overly model the same equipment, they will only think that they can A, solve it using that equipment, but they will also only associate that maths with that equipment. And we need to create generalizations where they realize that very often the equipment itself doesn't matter. It's more what you are, how you are using it and that the same mathematics can look very, very different using different pieces of equipment. Does that make sense to people? That four as four chairs, four as four counters, four as four children could be represented, all of those things could be represented with, with four counters and we could say that the counters are representing the children, the counters are representing the chairs because the fourness of four doesn't change. 
Um, this one again, these all these need a, long, a lot longer to look at, but encouraging children to represent problems in their own way. There is a time for children to draw things in a way where there's no adult input. Children are representing their ideas in ways that are, are we might call them emergent mathematics. But there's also a time for us to give them drawing tools to represent their ideas. And those two ideas are separate. Just like in writing, you've got emergent writing, but you've also got the rules of mark making. And of course, introducing those at the right time and being sensitive is a big part of children's writing. So think about that in maths as well. The main tools that you can introduce children to in early years are the part whole model. And those of you that are new to me and haven't done the foundation in masterclass yet, be very, very careful that in most published schemes, it's called the part part whole. That suggests that you can only split a number two ways. And of course, the reality is if you've got, for example, four, you can split four into a one, a one, a one, a one, a two, a one, a one, a three and a one and so forth. You don't want children to think you can only partition numbers in two ways because then they're never going to understand what division is. And we need to explore. And again, on the training, we do a lot of this with like wooden chips and all sorts of things. And it has been a big mind blowing moment for those of you who've trained with me saying, this is so obvious. Why didn't I do this? And you think, well, because you're using a recipe in Maths Mastery, White Rose, No Maths No Problem, whatever schemes you're accessing, you're following someone else's planning because someone wrote those schemes. You need to have more knowledge than that and then you can spot what's missing. I mean, ideally, of course, these schemes should be so perfect that they don't have anything missing, but that's never going to happen. Can you see here about them inventing their own representations? So, for example, I'll mention Mel again in the group. Uh, she posted some beautiful things that I'm going to use in a new course I'm writing that I'll tell you about later, where her children were representing, one child was representing the idea of what one was as part of an obstacle course, and was also representing the, I don't know, Mel, are you there? Can you unmute yourself? Just come on and say about the little girl who was turning on the obstacles, because you'll say it much better than me. Yeah, um, as part of the, the little group, they, they were making an obstacle course, and she, we were using hoops to help them structure it. And she got to this one hoop and we gave her a choice because she just didn't know what movement to pick. But she chose to spin around and she, you know, demonstrated it and she picked the number one. At that point, she just quite happily skipped off the walls where the white balls were being kept. And she drew um, one tally mark to show one and then drew a picture of herself um, with her arms out, showing that she was spinning around and then took it back to her hoop. And then following that, she then went around the whole obstacle course but stopping at each whiteboard because she knew that each of those whiteboards was telling her what she had to do and she was referring back to those each time. So you can hear just in that few minutes from Mel and just again just to give you a heads up the course I'm writing at the moment is called the obstacle course course and it's for you to see that you can, I'm, I'm going to be able to give you basically at least a, a month, a, no, a week's ideas of maths, it could be a month, but a week's idea of how to plan for maths without having children around a table, basically. this. And I know some of you don't do this, but the idea that we often end up pulling them away from their play and we feel really uncomfortable with this. So looking at how can we get even better mathematics than you're doing now, far better, but through the idea of an obstacle course. And the obstacle course is purely a vehicle, and Mel and I have been working on this and a few others, but it's about getting them to read instructions, carry out movements, follow instructions, give instructions, use numbers, um, work with direction, all the things that you know are really important, but in a really meaningful way. So you don't have just high attaining children either, you have all children wanting to do this and being able to do it. So the stuff that Mel's producing is brilliant and will be in that course. So you'll see the things that she's doing with her children. So can you see there that what Mel was describing, there's a lovely mix there of an adult modeling that if we write these instructions, we can tell somebody how, how to move and how many times to do it. So the child realizes that those funny little wiggles on that whiteboard or that paper meant that everybody who came to that whiteboard did the same thing. 
And when they came the next day, they did the same thing. And you're like, well, how does everybody know what to do? Well, because that's what writing is doing. These, this writing is communicating this. So it's a wonderful bringing together of mark making and mathematics. So think of writing as mark making as much as, as writing, and then you see the mathematical links. Um, this one we've kind of already covered by the fact that, I mean, everybody will know about this, that there's two issues here. One, a child will choose equipment because they just like it more than other equipment. It feels nice, yeah? And we've all, you know, when they start arguing over the pieces and that kind of thing. And for example, I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but I don't know if you can see my little person here, hold it closer to the camera. You know, there's this person, and there's this person. Now, can you see that the maths might stop being the focus? Because this person's going to have a little adventure with this person and do all sorts of things that when you thought you might decide to do. But also you might want this one and you don't want this one. And that is a massive distraction from the mathematics. And we've got to be aware of one of the things that I did massively, and I don't know if you do this, is I thought I'll try and make all my maths as colourful as possible, as dinosaurful as possible, as many different you know, coloured bears and everything. And what I didn't understand was I was detracting the children from seeing the maths so that they needed to see the maths bit and then apply it back with the dinosaurs and so forth. And we'll look at that. The second thing there is that I hear, particularly if you're here working with year one and year two on the webinar today, Year two teachers particularly, I'll mention this separately in a moment, but they'll say, oh, every time I give them equipment, they just mess with it. And I'll say, well, do you know, I work with adults and if I put equipment on the table that they don't know what it is, the adults will mess with it. And it's like, come on, take a step back. I mean, someone just type on, the, on your chat box there. Why do children pick up equipment and touch it? So just give me some, you know, your, your, your insights as an early years practitioner, why on earth and why do adults do it as well? Yeah, you can see it coming through. I'm gonna pick up on what Rani said. It's interesting. One thing I say to adults on courses about their mobile phones is, could we have mobile phones in bags because I know your phone is more interesting than me. And I don't have a problem with that, but I do have a problem with you having it out there for. Is everyone happy that the, that the equipment is more interesting than you? Are we all big enough to accept that? You know, I'm sorry, if you put some equipment in front of me, particularly if I'm three, four and five, and you're always there and it's not always there, what person thinks that you're going to be more interesting? It's like, come on, you know. So it's novel. And the answer, of course, is A, they need a lot of time to explore it. Of course they do, because then they can learn how to use it a lot without you as well. But secondly, it's got to be available all the time. I do a lot of things. I call them toolboxes. Those of you who know me well, um, in fact, I've got one here. I know I'm little on your screen, but you know, it's, a, it's, 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 it's revolutionary. It's a plastic box with a lid on it. Um, but I use these right up through year six. And the big message, because I work through primary as well, is I don't change the equipment in the box for year sixes or for five-year-olds, because what you can do with the equipment is what changes. And I want the children to know that the equipment is a tool and the tool just gets more and more sharpened. I don't want them to think there's year six equipment and five-year-old equipment, that's a load of nonsense, but we know that equipment tends to drop off as children get older. So lots of time to explore, always available, so it's not a novelty. Yeah, so really important. Um, this one here is just lovely. Manipulatives will enable a child to talk about mathematics. And those of you that are in my momentum group, which if anybody's interested in that, ask me about that on the page later. We met um, the wonderful Maeve and Jasmine from Oakwood in Leeds last week uh, through a Zoom call. And they were talking about how much since I've been working with them, how much their EAL children have developed in mathematics. Because when you can use equipment, you actually A, don't need to talk because you make the equipment do things and therefore you are talking through the equipment and someone can see what you mean. But secondly, if you've got two Polish speakers in your room and they are doing maths in Polish and I don't speak Polish, I don't need to speak Polish because I do speak maths. 
and I, I don't need to understand the words they're using and they can talk freely because I know if someone said to me, can you do all your reasoning in French, Karen? I probably wouldn't sound that great at maths and it's not my maths that's not great. It's my ability to explain it in French that's not great yet. So when we ask children who are EAL to explain their thinking in math, in English, if, if English is their second or third language, we are not going to be able to assess their thinking. Whereas it's perfectly reasonable to ask maybe an EAL child that once they've had a chance to think through something to make a statement in English. Because for most of your children, making a statement is them using the language called maths. Does that make sense to everybody that when they say something like, because the language they use in maths isn't always everyday language. So you can kind of expect to work towards that, but let all the reasoning happen in a, you know, in a home language works much better, but also nonverbal. Does that, um, just put some comments up. Does that all make sense, everybody? Is that, and if someone's got some lovely, Kirsten's got some lovely buttons in front of her and she's playing with them. I think now everybody's wishing they brought buttons. People are gonna start holding up what they have brought and go, look, this is so nice, this thing I've got here. So the thing I want to finish on, on this page is this paragraph here. Just read through that. I hope you can see it on the screen or on your own page and just have a look at what that key message is there. Okay, I don't know how fast you read, so I'll, I'll start talking slowly. But the key message there, if you've been working with me on these webinars since the start, you'll know if I turn, if you turn to the beginning of your document, if you've got it in front of you, pages six and seven, that you've got the five recommendations there. And the most important recommendation is number one, because it says all of the practitioners working with children need to have developing maths subject knowledge. So if you think about you personally first and all of the team you work with, where is that reliable, high quality, developing math subject knowledge coming from? Are you like I used to be, hiding in the early years because you didn't have a great experience at maths at school and you think, oh, the maths is easier in the early years and I'll be okay. That is a huge amount of practitioners and was me as well, way before obviously I was a maths consultant. I will make the statement now, and there's a lot more to say, but if you didn't do well at maths at school, it's not you, it's the way you were taught. Because you are a human being and you are highly mathematical, you were born that way. When you are taught that maths is put on a board and you need to follow rules and get it right, and particularly at speed, you are not being taught maths. And there's a lot more I can tell you about that, but that was me and I failed. And I do this for a living now. So I'm probably the best example of someone who's gone from one extreme of hating maths and failing to being an international maths consultant. So you'd be, you would find it quite hard to argue with me on this one. I can give you lots to help you if you're still where I used to be. But it's not you, it's the way you've been taught. So please, you know, come on to more of these if you want to hear more about how much you can change. But you will never, ever change how you feel about maths until you learn maths. And until you learn not to be frightened, and you must, and I know everybody here in this group that knows me well knows this is 100% true now, you need to understand the maths up to year six and beyond. And that doesn't have to be hard or scary, but if you feel that you're scared now, you're not alone and it's completely understandable, but it's just because you haven't learned the things you need to know yet. So the best thing that I think most of us in the, and again, do comment, but the people who've done the Teaching Essential Number Sense Masterclass, they have said it's their own subject knowledge that has just gone through a massive transformation. They literally, there's lots, just look, I don't know if you can see other people on the second, see Kate nodding. People have said, I didn't know that I didn't know this. And some of these people have got A-level maths. They're not people who thought I was bad at maths and they've still had that transformation. So there's, you know, there's lots of wonderful places we can go together there. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and switch. So any questions, thoughts, anything you wanna share, pop them in the box while I'm just switching over. And look at what people are saying, because we've got a lot of people who are on the training and graduates are making lots of comments, which is lovely. I've lost my comment box, I was doing so well. I'll, I'll look at it later. Okay, so yeah, do pop your comments up and uh, Hang on a minute, where's me? Oh, there it is. Right. 
da, 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 okay. Oh, the private, so comments are private. Uh, so Shilpa's saying about best way to go about um, improving subject knowledge. Uh, Karen says, I'm a literacy person, but your videos on Facebook have got me hooked on maths. Do you know, Karen, you not only, we not only share a name, but I was asked to be a maths consultant earlier in my life. And I said, I don't want to do it. I want to work doing literacy because I, I could do literacy. I was terrified of maths and that I would, yeah, I was teaching it. So look how far I've come. Um, hard copy of the document, James is asking. James, I would recommend um, that you ask a local printer to do one for you because the quality is so good you will treat it with the respect that you would a bought book it will cost you a few pounds but it is absolutely worth it that's where i got mine done i stopped photocopying things at school a long time ago because it's such poor quality that i think you don't treat it as the resource it is but that would be my advice Okay, so back to this. Can um, someone, I can see Rani there. Can you give me a thumbs up, Rani, if you can see it says you don't know what you don't know. Thank you. So hold this in your mind all the time. Watch out for me tagging this on the bottom of all my, my posts because does everybody understand that statement that if you don't know what you don't know, you won't ask a question about it. You will not go and try and improve your knowledge. So the only way to find out what you don't know, you don't know, is to keep learning and you can only learn with an open mind if you've got anyone on your team that says i just don't like that way that's just not for me you've got real problems and if you find when the times we can all be like that but i would always recommend in your head either have oh this is interesting i want to know more or if you're feeling a little bit threatened or you're not sure put it in your i'm not sure about that yet box but I would recommend as educators and probably in life as well, never put anything in your, I'm not having any of that box because you'll never ever go back and revisit it. And that can be even things you feel very, very strongly about. If you put them in your, I'm not sure about that yet box, you might get things that make you go back and reevaluate what you think. It's certainly a kind of healthier, happier way to live as well. So this I put on the Facebook uh, page this week just have i'll read this out but have a look at that first statement because and i'll tell you why i put this up but i'm wondering what we'd think of a doctor intent on improving their patient's health if they asked for more ideas rather than more knowledge and understanding are we really focusing our energies on the things that matter most is anyone aware that when they joined my group they might have put in the reasons for joining were more ideas or something along those lines because I want us to be aware that about 80% of the teachers I work with or more are asking for ideas and activities. And I think rather than you see that as me criticizing anyone, you think, why? Why would we think that the way to improve maths is activities and ideas? Because the way to improve someone's health isn't activities and ideas. In fact, those people are dangerous because if you've ever wanted to lose weight, or get fit, how quickly do you jump on board the person who's got the perfect solution if you pay the right amount of money? Please nod and tell me that some people have done that. Yeah, we're all suckers for this, and of course marketing is, is aimed at this. There is no silver bullet in anything. If you wanna get fit, you have to put the work in and you have to understand how your body works and all of that. We know it's exactly the same with maths. So be aware of this snake oil approach. And I know I'm touching a nerve here with some people I know well in the group because there are people on now whose schools have spent £10,000 on schemes before they've had a conversation about what the problem is. Now, just be aware that schools do this over and over again. And I've done this as a senior leader. I've been here. You, the reason I'm mentioning this is it's your subject knowledge. It's the investment in you that makes the difference. If you then choose to adopt a scheme to sit alongside your knowledge and you say, look, there's going to be some great ideas in here we can use. Can you see that's a good idea? Because we've all sat there trying to think about planning and trying to come with ideas and you're like, oh, I can't think of anything. That's when you need the ideas. But the ideas don't take a poor practitioner to a good place because they're still using the same skills. So please be kind of painfully aware that look at your own investment in your own subject knowledge, ask the right questions about how best to do that. Um, as I keep mentioning the, in the foundation masterclass we're doing, it is a, a 
a place that will give you the ability to use any schemes or anything you're using in your school in a completely new way. So you don't have to throw away what's there, but you will have new fresh eyes to look at that. So just be aware of these things here. You have to understand the problem before you can select the right solution, of course, in any part of life. You have to have all the right skills to undertake a journey. So the way I thought about this, is everyone aware of the phrase, all the gear and no idea? You know, that thing about horse riding and jogging and that. Has anyone ever done that? You know, I'm going to be a cyclist. I'll go out and buy all the stuff. And then you stand there with all your, you know, everybody always knows who's new to the sport because they look amazing. But then they get on there. Raleigh's laughing there. But it's, you know, if you and your team are going to go on a journey to improve mathematics, don't make the first thing be being buying all the gear. And it's the same with manipulatives as well, because I get a lot of questions, which is great about, oh, we've got a bit of money. We want to buy some equipment. What should we buy? And I'll be like, well, A, what do you want to achieve? Because actually you've got to buy the right stuff in order to achieve it. And also be careful that you have the subject knowledge to know how to use that stuff. So I'm hoping all that sounds kind of really, really obvious, but also that people feel like I did when I realized that I was doing what we'd always done. I was not standing back from the problem and thinking, I don't even think we know what the problem is yet. So we certainly don't want to buy a solution. So there we go. That's a very famous phrase that I'm sure you've all seen before. Okay, could you please find, we're going to do about four things here. So let me think about how did I, um, oh, hang on, I'm just going to skip. Oh, I think I've lost my, I'm going to come back to that. I've lost a slide that I was going to show you. I'll come back to that. Okay, we'll do it this way instead. Could you write on the screen, please? And be careful you don't interpret what I'm saying in a different way than I'm saying it. What do you see there? And I want you to look at it through the eyes, maybe of a three-year-old or a four-year-old and be really literal. So anything you notice about this, just this here, I wouldn't normally have these on the screen if it was a child. Look at what other people are saying. And if you recognize it as a four, you can say a four as well, of course. I wonder. I'm just going to change the size of this and hopefully you can see what I can see. Okay, oops, don't want that. Which number is bigger? In fact, I'll tell you what, to make it easier to, uh, to differentiate, I'll do that. Which number is bigger? Yeah. So, you know, you think, OK, so for a start, thank you for all those contributions. You think most people said lines and black lines. So, of course, if it had been purple, we could have talked about purple lines. We know a four can be written in different ways as well. It can be like a closed four. Four is definitely the bigger number there, isn't it? So you think not only is this not telling us anything about the quantity four, it's also the words we use about which number is bigger and what is this. We're putting an image in children's mind that potentially, well, definitely at the end of this journey will be incredibly useful. But if this is our starting point, we're starting completely the wrong way around. So that's what we're gonna have a look at here. And it's gonna to link to the work that you did with the apples last time. Okay, I'm gonna say that this is an abstract representation of four. That's what we call that in maths or a symbolic representation. Here's a pictorial representation. So look at four there. If I go back to this four, I'll just get rid of the eight for now. Again, be careful how you interpret my question. How many twos can you see in that four? Just write them on the screen. Okay, so you get the general idea. When you ask how many twos, so if that was a calculation, it could be written as four divided by two, meaning one of the interpretations is how many twos are in four. Okay, so let's go pictorial. You can see that the symbol for four has slightly changed, which again, maybe we don't always notice. I think, you know, and again, is it wrong to change that symbol or should we represent the way that four can appear in all its different forms? Um, how many twos in four using this pictorial representation? How many can you see? 
And I say, some of you have done this activity with me, but it's a great one to share with your staff, particularly if you work right up to year six in your school. So, okay, great. So there's the calculation we're doing. We wrote it mathematically. So the first time you said the answer was zero, and now you're saying the answer is one. And we know mathematically that neither of those answers are correct. So we're going to have to use some form of resource that will allow you to see the right answer, to allow you to understand what's going on. And then this pictorial image will become very useful because it's not wrong, it's just being used at the wrong time. Okay, so if you use mine to begin with, and then I'm going to call on what you've got. So there's four things. Uh, so have a look on the screen now and just see, you know, how many twos can you see there? Are you looking for the digit two? So you're doing something that young children naturally do and they, le they learn, they unlearn this. When I've done this activity with year three and I've shown them, for example, like some eggs or something, and I ask them what numbers they see, they say no numbers or how, you know, not how many, but what numbers can you see this? They have learned that numbers are just digits. They have completely lost their ability to see it as quantity. Young children can do this naturally. We know about this with subitizing if you've done, say, on the training. So could you now, with your objects that you've brought, if you brought some things along with you, so for example, here's mine, random things. So obviously, if this was yours, you might have the book, obviously, is going to be much bigger than the Jelly Baby. I've done this just to show some random things. So put them out in front of you and arrange them however you like. You might arrange them in a, a nice pattern for that you're more familiar with or just a bit randomly. Okay, so just type on the screen, try, and again, try and think very human in this way, because obviously you're the age you are, but what's your attention being drawn to? Either if you haven't got anything, use mine on the screen, or have a look at your things. Obviously, I don't know what you've got, but just what's popping into your head when you look at them? So we've got colour, jelly baby, mug, all different, heart, don't match, pink pom-pom, got some great stuff. I think we need some photographs of these. If you've got your phone handy, take a picture of your four objects now and po we'll post them on the page later. That would be really nice. The object I want to play with, says James, if it is James, yeah, yeah, almonds. And even if, if you didn't bring anything, just grab four things randomly from near you. Okay, so presumably your objects, I said, do you have something you can hold in your hand, but it didn't necessarily have to fit completely in your hand, but you've got different size objects, you've got different colors, you've got things you like, things that you're less interested in, uh, things that have got uh, shared values and shared properties. This might be, a, a, just as an aside, can you see this as a great potential for like which one's the odd one out and why? You know, do you do this with your children a lot? Because those of you, again, that have worked with me a lot know that my two favorite questions are, what do you see and how do you see it? And this is just about helping children to continue to be notices. Children are naturally notices. And I know that's a made up word, but maths is so much tied, just like sciences, to what do you notice? How would you categorize this? What are the properties? But you can see that your brain, because you are a highly scientific, highly mathematical being, even on a Sunday morning, is engaging with all the properties of the things. It's the maths is there, but it's very hidden. Now, can you use either your pasta or your bits of paper that I asked you to bring? And when you're doing this with the children, the reason I said pasta is it's just easy for you to, to get where you live, but you need things that are the same size, the same shape and the same color. So mine, I'm gonna go back to this and put them as a, you, if you want, you can put them next to the objects to begin with, to say, if you feel you need to, you could say, well, this for the past is gonna represent the, um, the jelly baby, or you could just put them out almost as a separate group and say, that would be the jelly baby, that would be the book, that would be the sellotape, that would be the, the car. And what you've done now is a really important move in maths. Probably the most difficult step you ever have to take in maths, and it's not hard for young children, I'll come back to that in a moment. But you have said, this piece of pasta represents something else. Or, and of course, pasta is less preferable because it is a thing in its own right. Can you see that? I know a counter is, but a counter is a little bit more 
you know, meaningless. But your little bit of paper, if you've got that, the little bit of paper represents the jelly baby and you've got four things that are the same. Young children do this brilliantly. You know, when they're doing role play and they pick up, uh, for example, in, I've got, oh, I don't know, a piece of paper. Maybe they pick up a book and they say things like, oh, I'm just, I'm just having my toast before I go to work. And then the role play. And they, and, they, and they see you vacuuming and they grab something else and they make it into their vacuuming. How good are children from a very, very young age at saying some, one thing is pretending to be something else? So they're really good at it. Now that's the premise of maths. The premise of maths is we're gonna use something to represent something else. But the brilliant thing about maths is we actually use the same tools to represent everything. So when you understand that, you actually don't have to share and teach them very many tools. They just have to realize that this tiny amount of tools can represent anything and everything. Now, if you haven't been taught like that, like I wasn't, you'll get it, but you'll start thinking, oh my goodness, this is a completely different way of thinking about maths. But you'll also see that maths is this beautiful language and this wonderful toolbox. And it literally is your children will have the same tools moving through school from early years to year six and beyond they'll just become more and more adept at using them. So I hope that makes sense. It's the same tools, which is why consistency throughout the school is really important. Okay, have a look at my next image now. So can you see there that this time I've done what I think we do a lot, which is we think, but we'll do four cars, or we'll do four bears, or we'll do four bits of fruit. Now, you have to have quite a level of sophistication to see, to know that these all belong in the same group, which a lot of children are developing. But again, can you see there, I won't ask you because of time, but can you see that your attention as an adult is possibly not drawn straight away to the fourness of four there? It's drawn to lots of other things. So what's happening there is your cognitive load, as in cognitive being where your brain works, your brain's having to work loads harder than it needs to. Now, don't get me wrong, I want your children to be able to, in the future, look at four cars like that and see that there's two twos and a three and a one and four ones. But that's too much for them to begin with. And certainly when you have four random objects, can you feel that the cognitive load has gone up again? And there's loads you want to talk about and there's loads you want to say. And of course, we should be using images like that to have those conversations, not to teach children what four is. So if I go back to this, so is your paper or your pasta, just write on the screen, those of you who've done lots of subvertising with me, play along, I know you're experts in this. Look at those four and what can you see and how are you seeing it? So if you're not used to doing the subvertising challenges with me, maybe watch what other people do because they won't just split them into two groups. So just see what comes up on the screen and, and join in. Okay, so you can see there, it's coming up super fast as well. That's very impressive. So we could have, can you see as well, again, from the training we talked about with subvertising, can you see if you've got your four bits of paper in front of you, you do this physically because you can move yours. I'll get my board. Your four bits of paper or your four bits of pasta down in front of you. And can you move them into equal groups? And think about what would you need to understand as a child to understand and you know equal comes in in very very early and yet it's a really quite a difficult concept so if i do that and i was a child saying this is a group and this is a group are they equal and what math skills and language skills would you have to have as a child to be able to explain and prove what you think because it's not about getting it right it's about saying why do i think that so something i was doing with some of the teachers the other day was saying rather than talk about things being right or wrong and saying things like it's okay to get it wrong i would recommend you don't say things like that what you say is when you can tell me why you think what you think that's what i'm looking for so in your mind i mean with the older children we could be more explicit here with older children we could say i'm not interested in whether it's right or wrong i'm interested in whether you can explain your thinking or not because when children explain their thinking and their answers wrong they will reveal to you why it's wrong Whereas if you just ask for right or wrong answers, you won't know why they think what they think and they won't know why they think what they think, which is why we get children in key stage two who go like this. It was just in my head because they were born knowing the answer to everything. You all met those children. 
and they genuinely don't know there's a process to get from A to B because no one ever asked them to notice it. They just know the B bit and they get very, very frustrated. And you think, I'd much rather have a child who started here, started to explain their thinking and then went, oh, that's as far as I can get. Great. So now my assessment for learning tells me that's as far as they can get. What do I need to do to help them move on? I don't want a child who thinks I'm here and I don't know the answer, so I'm going to say nothing. And that happens in you know, lots and lots and lots of classes. So be, be aware of that. So can you split your uh, four in another way so you've got equal amounts in each part? So move your counters and things. If I do mine correctly this time, I could have had, well, four ones, or I could have had two twos. Is there another possibility? Somebody type something. I can do four ones. I'm trying to do my neutral face here. Someone says no. Anybody agreeing, disagreeing? So the terminology here is a little bit ambiguous because I had to say groups. If I say, is there another way of me splitting this or arranging this equally, it does the, our answer change. It's, I say it's very hard to ask this in, in a way. So yeah, so you could, and you're quite right in the way that I asked it to say no, you could have one group of four. So four can be arranged as one equal group and it's equal to itself, four ones and two twos. Is everyone aware that they are the factors of four? So has anybody gone, ooh, I'm feeling a bit cleverer. I was early years, I didn't think we did factors. And you think factors are just about how you split a number equally. And the one that people will miss out usually is the, is the whole number itself. And you need to understand that because if you reduce your number now, in fact, actually, let's increase it. Increase your number to five and move it around in front of you. Explore all the ways of, and I know you know, but explore physically all the ways of dividing five equally and write on the screen what you can do. And we're doing whole numbers here, obviously. We're not cutting things up yet into fractions. So someone said we can have. One, 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 one. So five groups of one, or we can keep it as one group of five. So when a number can only be arranged equally as itself and one, what's that called? Somebody type it up. Prime. So prime numbers and factors are related. What year group would be teaching prime numbers and factors? Put that on the screen. You have a guess if you're not sure. Yeah, from year four so year four is the year is the the year you turn nine is that right so you are purely by moving these counters around in a way that you know your three and four year olds can do you are teaching prime numbers and factors so it's the same maths but you if your math subject knowledge isn't good can you see you wouldn't know that and can you see as well that when for example we split if we only ever split five into a three and a two because we're doing part part whole we will not recognize that five can go into five ones and one five, and therefore it's got that prime number. Whereas if you reduce that number to four, it's not prime. In fact, also it's got another property. God, I'm gonna feel so clever after this call. Not brilliantly shown with counters, better shown with cubes, but look on the screen. It's a square number. Because when you have two multiplied twice, so the first square number is one times one, which kind of looks a bit strange, doesn't look very square. Second number in square numbers is two times two, so that would be four. What would the next number be in the square number sequence and how easily could your children see this and build it? I'll just move my board because I can't talk and build at the same time. Was anybody lucky enough to be taught square numbers by actually building them or did everybody get bored to death like I did with a presumably an L dot O dot equivalent when I was at school in the 70s and 80s where someone just told me and I instantly forgot because I didn't care. <laughs> yeah, so isn't it amazing that our teachers, presumably, I imagine you had some nice teachers, they didn't not teach you about square numbers using practical equipment because they thought, I can't be bothered. They genuinely didn't think that's what maths was. So young children can see that the next sequence would be four fours. They don't have to know it's 16. That's not important. But then they'll do five fives and six sixes and so forth. So go back to six things. How many ways can you divide six 
unequally. You don't have to arrange it like that, but pull it apart and just write some of your answers on there in the chat box. And look at what everybody's doing and see that they're not all doing just two numbers. So unequally and force yourself to think about two parts, but also more than two parts. And think about the reasoning that those of you, for example, are saying you could have a one, a two and a three. How do you know that those groups aren't equal to each other? What is the mathematical skill that your children are going to have to use to prove that? Not just to say there's more and there's less, but actually that one to one correspondence we'd have to do. Can you now for the last part of this split it equally? Put up some possibilities, but physically move these because if you are my children, I don't want you to just say stuff. I want you to prove it. I'll copy some of the things I can see. So we have two, two, two. And again, you know, you know how well you know this, but the ones that get missed out, the threes and twos get noticed straight away. The ones that get missed out are this one, the fact that it can be one group of six, and therefore it can also obviously be six groups of one. So right on the board, what are the factors of six? All the ways it can be divided equally if you're not familiar with factors yet. So all you're asking yourself, you see, the fact is, is just a word. It's a fancy word, meaning do you understand what it means to divide a number equally? So is six a prime number? Can it only be divided by one in itself? Does anybody else need convincing that early years maths underpins all other mathematics? So I'm really hoping, even though those of you who know me really, really well, you kind of think, gosh, you know what? This is where confidence comes from with your TAs and your teachers and your senior leaders. If you're having trouble getting people maybe in year six to take what you do seriously or an SLT who's never worked in early years, we need to show them these things. It's so important. So one more thing, arrange your six like this. Okay, can you still see the three twos and the two threes and the six ones and the one six? That's a silly question, isn't it? Young children need to see things moved apart. As they get older, they will accept that those twos are there even when they're one group. But can you see there that the brain struggles a little bit to see these as twos? Because if you were to, in a PE lesson and you went into groups of twos, they wouldn't stand as a group of six with three twos in them. They would need to move away from each other. So be aware of how important. So this could represent six children and you get themselves to move themselves into these arrangements. So they know that this counter represents them. And it doesn't matter if they're in the hall or they're sitting around a table and they start to realize that they are being represented. Then we could think about, for example, this is something that I did with the egg share when you go back to the Facebook page. Imagine these are, are raisins. In fact, I'll move them apart like this. So imagine this is snack time. We did this last time. So there's two children and they want to share these raisins between them or these grapes or whatever they are. Can you see how many they could definitely have each? Even if you can't split it completely yet as a child, could they definitely have one each? Can you use your subvertising to see, could they definitely have two each? So you're imagining, for example, they could have these two and someone else will says, well, I could have these two. So we say, okay, let's just allocate those then. How many can you definitely have each now? So they see that, well, I could have that one and I could have that one. And you're doing what we call chunking in key stage two. And a lot of, a lot of teachers are allergic to chunking because they don't understand it. And they've all gone, no, I'm just going to teach them long division and short division. But the idea that as an adult, you never go like this. You know, if you've got six things, you never go one for you, 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 one for you. Have you ever seen adults doing that as a real life problem solving solution? You only do that if they don't like the people they're sharing it with and they're stalling for time, I think. All adults will chunk an amount that they know and then they will look at what's left and they'll chunk that. So you think, why would we ever teach our children to do this ridiculous, like one for you, one for you, one for you? No, let's count them all again. So it comes back to subvertising again. Okay, so, uh, oh, no video. Oh no, how long has it been off for? Someone else said it's still working. Give me a thumbs up if I'm still on the video for you, everybody. Okay, so it's just one person. It's flashing a little bit for me, Karen. It's what, sorry? It's flashing. Okay. The actual share screen is flashing. 
Okay, so have I come off the share screen now? Am I back on the screen with all of you? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody? Uh, okay, we're all right. It looks a bit, a bit. Sometimes I'll say I do apologise. It's it's the strength of our internet here. Um. Okay. Thoughts there. Was anybody having? And I mean, those of you again that know me well from the training, you know this feeling of like mind blowing, like. This is so obvious. Anybody having any feelings like that? So Ronnie's saying a wow moment. Just share some thoughts there and then we'll sort of tie things up for this session. But you can see why we need to have lots of these so we can do a little bit and do it really well. Epiphany, and you, great spelling, Linda, as well. I'm not sure I'd know how to spell that. Prime number wow moment. Chunking in year four says, Kate, great. You see, this is where we need to, if we understand the maths, we won't be allergic to certain techniques that are not mentioned explicitly in the national curriculum. Oh, yeah. So um, I might pronounce your name wrong. Is it Salea? If you tell me if I'm, how, come on and tell me how to say, ah, she's, yeah, thank, I've got it said it correctly, but how she wishes she'd been taught maths like this. So all I'm doing here is saying, just like the apple task, just wave at me if you did the apple task with me last time. Okay, so what we did, if you didn't do the apple task, go back and watch the 14th of June's webinar. We said that if you look at the word apple, A-P-P-L-E, it tells you nothing about apples. If you look at a photograph of an apple, it only really gives you information if you know what an apple really is. The only thing you can learn about apples from is an apple. And when you've got it in front of you, you don't have to try very hard to learn. You just have to notice and be engaged and ask questions. You don't have high ability notices, do you? Would you agree? It's like make an effort to join in people. You know, it's like anybody who interacts will be intelligent. People who sit back, even if they've been given brilliant genes and DNA, it doesn't, if you don't use it, it doesn't work. Okay, suddenly making sense. Oh, do you know, you'll, you know, you'll skip off for the rest of the day after this. So I'm aware of the time. I'm going to wrap things up within the next 10 minutes. So I'm going to show you a couple, just a couple more things. And then we definitely need more time to do this. But I wanted this to be really, really simple. Uh, I'm just going to go on to this. So I can, again, I, I can see Kate. Kate, can you see a, a diagram that says ability to subitize? And great, thank you. Um, so there, what I've done, and I'll make these available to you because I know that'll be the next lot of questions that comes through. Okay. Um, subitizing is, is absolutely my baby. It is the thing that I have learned more about and continue to learn more about. And all of you are saved on the foundation stage masterclass know it has literally blown our minds. It, it's going to be mentioned in the new early years curriculum if you use the English curriculum, but it, it's not going to be explained. It's, it's, it's definitely great news that it's going to be there. But the trouble is, if you don't know what you don't know, you're still not going to teach it. And the main key messages I'll give you, and you can see, as I say, we need to do a lot more with this, is subitizing is a skill that children are born with. We see evidence that babies can do a form of subitizing, which is if you do the training, you'll learn more about that. It's amazing. We have lots of evidence that pre the number system, as we know it now, humans use subitizing before they had number names and before we had a counting system and that in itself is something we see young children doing a lot when you understand what that is and subitizing as i've just shown you there is going to underpin your ability to add subtract multiply divide use fractions and it doesn't involve counting but counting is still really important but counting is not the same as subitizing and counting itself will cause children problems in calculating because we see ch children in key stage two who are still doing this. They've got their column methods and they're doing this and they have no sense of the base 10 system which subitizing leads to. And they are doing things that are one very heavy cognitive load but also will lead to a lot of problems in terms of accuracy. The way this then connects is this is what you build your 10 frames on. So I'm just going to um, come off so I can just do a little bit of a see who waves. Just wave at me if you use 10 frames with your children. OK, so I'm just trying to go across the screens here. Keep waving, keep waving, keep waving. OK, so this obviously, again, if you've done the training, you'll know more about this. Did you have training in how to use them or did you just start using them from the textbook or scheme? So in most cases, people have discovered them through the scheme, 
started to use them and in most cases children are counting on a 10 frame that is is going to be a disaster but you are not to blame because if you've had no training and the textbook doesn't say any different because the people who wrote the textbook don't know this either you will you the 10, 10 frame is pointless if you're counting on it it's about seeing concept images and it, and it will empower your children wonderfully so we can move on to that in the next webinar in terms of calculating but be aware of the issues there okay i'm gonna finish then and i'll have a look so any other questions pop them up and i'm going to go back to that diagram again just scan your eyes around there and think about how that diagram fits with what i showed on the whiteboard and you did with your bits of paper or pasta was a missing just put it. if you see any more typos do let me know and this is just the start but what we've shown today is it's that knowledge that underpins prime numbers and factors it's that knowledge that you can see if you've got the knowledge yourself which will underpin your ability to calculate using fractions so I did, uh, I know Nicole's on, anybody else from Jersey on today, I was working, I uh, had a lovely conversation with Andy Parkinson, your, your maths advisor from the island, and I showed him a calculation using just six, like we had here, and we did a bit more with it, and I said, I'm very excited, he said, look, that's year six maths, and he said, no, it isn't, Karen, and I went, oh, and he said, it's foundation GCSE, what you've just done. So that blew me away. That was about calculating with fractions, which I didn't show you there, but it was using six foam counters. And I don't think he could see where I was going with it. And when we went from early years to what turned out to be foundation GCSE, I went off skipping around the room for the rest of the day. So it's mind blowingly wonderful. Okay, so does this statement, which I think goes back to statement one, the recommendation one about your subject knowledge, does this really resonate with people? And are you, have you got the mindset where you don't feel guilty? You just think I've got to do things constantly to help me know what I don't know. Because it's okay to not know, but it is not okay to keep not knowing. Say that to your staff. It is totally okay to not know, but it's not, I don't know this yet. What are you going to do about it? Who's going to help you? Who's going to improve? So I'm going to leave you with, um, the opportunity totally up to you obviously but if you want to learn more and you want to join and you know you can see, you can see the excitement on the screen here come and join i've been looking at the i haven't got time to show you now this one but i was looking at, on the online training and the comments that are filling up the bottoms of the screen now from you all which you'll those of you who've done the foundation masterclass and the math through stories you get to read all the comments that people have made and it's fantastic but for those of you that have been able to come today I don't know if you can see this on the screen I'll put it on the page for 24 hours only I thought about what I could offer you and I think from what you've all done this one seems to be the most popular I will put a code up I'll show you in a minute but I'll put it on the Facebook page if you want to do the essential number sense course which if you came out on training with me would be the usual kind of you know a couple of hundred pounds plus your supply plus your travel it's 99 pounds but i'm going to give you the mastery stories course for free which many of the people on the call here have done and you have to have done the essential number sense course to access the mastery stories because you use all your subtitling and 10 frames there so if you want that you've got the opportunity to do that so it'll only last till tomorrow and i'll put this link up and that will take you straight there if there is anybody who has purchased those separately, do let me know if you paid full price for them. Or if there's anybody, for example, who bought the 20% off the, which I offered recently, if there's anything like that, just send me an email and I'll make sure you don't pay more than anybody else on there. So that'd be fair. So do let me know. Um, and I'm, the next one coming up is the obstacle course course. And I'll make sure that's available. My aim is to make it available before you finish for the summer for those of you that are in so you can do it with your children and i will save you a whole week of planning and you i thought also it'd be brilliant to bring together all the things that you learn with your children so how does that sound in terms of so hopefully that's given everybody something those of you that have already done all the essential masterclass and the mastery stories you've got the obstacle course coming and people like mel and other people that i'm working with the wonderful thing is it's going to be informed by their practice now so you will get photos and input from what they're doing with their three to fives which is just fantastic
The Master of Stories, by the way, someone's just written. Um, it's Harry in the Bucket Full of Dinosaurs. It's someone help me here. It's one is a snail, 10 is a crab, and it's Elmer. Is that right? People have done it. And it's how to use everything you learn in the Foundation Masterclass to teach math through stories. And you will, you will see how your life has just been made so much easier, which is what I'm after. Easier and a lot better, obviously. Um, Marie says, when, is the when and how is the tra training delivered? When you go on that Facebook three to five page, you just need, oh, my little dog's just come in to say hello. I go back to that. Can you see this website here? This is the website you need. And I'm going to be updating things on there, but that is where all the training is. It's all on video. The wonderful thing is you can pause it whenever you want. You've got access to the courses for at least three months. You can go back and watch it as many times as you like. And unlike a trainer, you don't miss stuff and you've got as much time as you need to say to pause things and try things out. So, oops. Any other questions? I'll just have a look. How do we find the subitizing stuff on the Facebook? Uh, I can't fit the unit you meant. Oh, can't find, I'm imagining Helen saying. Can somebody else help there? It depends on what device you're using, where the units is, menu is. I think it moves around. So I don't know if anybody wants to come on. And, and I know you can't see what Helen can see. She's on the laptop. Is it a Mac, Helen, or a PC? PC. Anybody that uses a, a PC laptop get any idea where on the Facebook page and why Helen wouldn't see it? Because I say it's not always in the same position. Mine's down the side here, but on my phone it's across the top. But it should be, I use a phone, a tablet and a Mac computer and it, whatever I use it on it does show up in some place. Okay, I don't know there so just to finish that there's lots of people asking about that so join the three to five page i'll also put the details on the early years maths page the fact because some of you came in through that you've got say 24 hours till pretty much the end of I'll, like mid time midday tomorrow to sign up for it and you can start whenever you like if you want to leave it till the summer holidays you can and the lovely thing is you can do 10 minutes here 20 minutes there and and one thing i will say as well is if you do it and you think it hasn't been worth the money i will give you your money back you have nothing to lose okay i'll put the link to the offer on the facebook page okay helen can you helen asked about the units maybe contact me directly by email or something if you're still struggling and we'll make sure you can access it okay Everybody okay? Everyone's smiling. Yeah, it's so lovely to see loads of new people, loads of people who I know well, and I know you're from all over the world as well. So have a wonderful Sunday, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. And um, are you up for some more of these? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, a quick poll on um, thumbs up if this, yes, please. this works well on a Sunday morning for you. Okay, yes, thank you. Thumbs up if somebody would prefer an early evening. Let's just have a look. Do a kind of sideways thumb if you don't mind either way. Let, let's see. Okay, I'm thinking that was kind of fairly overwhelming first thing. Sometimes Sunday you think, Ugh, but actually I think we're all in a pretty good place, aren't we? Yeah, okay. Well, you turn up for it. I'm very, very happy to, to do them. Thanks everybody. Lovely to see you all and see you all again soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.